Let's give a big round of applause for our first breakout session of today. All right, let's go. <laughs> You're starting it off well. Please welcome Brett Whittingham and Sarah Gadala, and they're going to start off with cloud budget and forecast process. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Joe, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Can everyone hear me okay? No. Okay. Maybe I need to raise my voice. Can you now hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so, today we'll be talking to you about the cloud budget and forecast process, but let's first introduce ourselves, what we do and who we are. So, I'm Sara, I'm a principal FinOps analyst in Atlassian. I'm the technical lead for all the FinOps practices within the company. My journey with Atlassian, FinOps, and the FinOps Foundation started three years ago. But prior to that, I was working in the data and analytics space for 11 years. A year ago, I started the FinOps Meetup community in Australia and started to organize Sydney FinOps Meetup. And I'm one of the foundation ambassadors for APAC region. So in Atlassian, FinOps partnership closely with the engineers and the finance teams. This is why I'm presenting today with one of my partners in crime from our finance department, Brett. I'll let him introduce himself. Thanks, Sarah. Hi everyone, my name is Brett Whittingham. I'm based out of Melbourne, Australia, currently in the role of Senior Finance Analyst Cloud Spend at Atlassian. I'm the key finance leader for the Cloud Spend at Atlassian. Prior to Atlassian, I worked as a Senior Finance Technology Manager. I joined the FinOps Foundation last year and it educated me on how I could help organisations make cost financially data-driven decisions and ensure they got the most value from cloud. It also helped me to make the decision to take a career pivot where I was leading technology financials as a generalist to move into cloud as a specialist. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, Brett. Cool. So just a little bit of background about Atlassian in case anyone here haven't used our products yet. So we develop products for software engineers and project managers with a focus on collaboration. So no wonder collaboration is in our DNA. We have over 100 teams globally developing products in 190 countries for 250K customers, out of which 200K are paying cloud customers. 75% of Fortune 500 companies use Atlassian products. So this gives you an idea of the scale and the size of our cloud footprint. And because of this size of the cloud footprint, we have a dedicated cloud FinOps team that has also been there for three years because I was the first hire in this dedicated team. But now we have a team of 11 people with different skill set. We have software engineers, cloud architect, data engineers, FinOps analysts like myself, program manager, engineering manager. And having a team this size and with this mix of skill sets enabled us to use our own tools and capabilities in our FinOps practices and tailor them to Atlassian unique ways of working. So this is our agenda for today. We're going to be talking about how we elevated the importance of cloud costs in Atlassian and also cover the foundation that enabled us to get there. And then Brett will talk to us about the finance side of the budget process. And then we'll wrap it up with some lessons that we learned in our journey. And then we're going to have a few minutes at the end for all your questions. So while this talk is mainly focused on budget and forecast, we'll also be covering other FinOps capabilities like how we created and fostered a FinOps culture in the company where we can take informed decisions on our cloud cost and also charge back finance integration, cost allocation, tagging, tagging hygiene. Let's first start with why. Why we have a cloud budget. So I would assume, similar to everyone here in the room, our cloud cost is material and it was increasing exponentially. At a point in time, I remember we had over 50% increase year over year in our cloud invoice. It was that material. And we wanted to push engineers and empower them by making them accountable. But we also understood that telling engineers how much they're spending on cost only is not enough because it doesn't give them the urgency. We wanted to give them a target and put a dollar value to that target. And this for us was the budget. The budget simply keeps you from overspending and underperforming. And because we care so much about our product gross margins, we wanted our engineers to understand the impact of any decisions they take on their budget and on their product gross margins. And this is why we have a budget. 
Before we go into the budget process, let's first cover the foundation that enabled us to have a cloud budget. So Atlassian is a big engineering company. We have so many cloud accounts. Some of them are dedicated, of course, but some of them are shared, have shared services, or even shared data layer. And we understood that starting early on our tagging journey is extremely crucial because we understood the importance of having this strong foundation for our cost allocation. When we thought of tagging, we thought of multiple tags and how we want to break down our costs. So tags like service, products, cost centers. And we also thought of how we can make sure that the value in the tag is valid. And this is very important because you, you want to detect not only that the value in the tag is not null, but if it's actually valid. So for example, a cost center tag would have only the value of a valid cost center from our finance systems. And then at this point, finance and FinOps realized where good tagging and cost allocation can take us. And we wanted to educate the engineers on the expectations from them around tagging. So we created something we call tagging policy, which mandates four tags in every taggable resource in Atlassian. It's a good reference that engineers can go back and refer to, and new engineers can also learn from, as we included this in their onboarding material. Afterwards, we wanted to create a measure of success for ourselves, so we created a metric called tagging coverage metric, which is basically a percentage of the untagged or invalid cost from your total taggable cost. And we aim for this to be within 1% across all of Atlassian and across different cost centers. Of course, we have visualizations and reports that would show us the untagged percentage across Atlassian and for each business division. Let's have a look at one of these reports as an example. Just a disclaimer, this is an actual report from Atlassian, but these are made up numbers. I made them myself, so yeah, don't use this to try to guess our cloud cost. It's not gonna be true. Um, so as you can see, we're showing the untagged percentage but we're also showing the materiality of it. And this is very important because as your cloud cost is increasing, engineers could be thinking that one or 2% is not really big deal, but when they see that this one or 2% is 50K or even 1000K, this is when they realize the importance of tagging. We're also showing the week over week changes in the tagging percentage because we wanted engineers to see the reflection of their tagging effort and the top five business units in terms of the untagged percentage and also their materiality. A bit of naming and shaming, but so they can feel the urgency. Uh, and of course, we also have other reports and dashboards that enable each business unit and cost center to drill down and see the details of these untagged resources so they can action them accordingly. I think some of you might be wondering, well, if the resource is untagged, how come you could allocate it to a business unit or a cost center? And this is what I'll be covering in the tagging hygiene section. But let's take a deep breath because this is an interesting topic. So tagging hygiene is a, a topic that I often see in the community, and it's not a surprise because tags are free text. They leave a room for mistakes, upper lower cases mistakes, typos, or even if engineers try to perfect it, in our case, the problem was frequent changes of cost center names. It was almost impossible to perfect tags, and the problem with tags that once a cost is incurred, it's incurred with that mistake, and it takes time to fix. I see people nodding their heads around the room. Everyone is feeling the pain of the tags. So this is why we automated a process in collaboration with our finance team where we could actually bridge the gap between what the finance wants and what the engineers are doing. So we automated a process that would allocate the cost based on some business logic and the value on the tag. So the value on the tag is not necessarily how it ends up being allocated, but it ends up being allocated to where the finance wants it but it was important at this stage to show the engineers this mapping process, how it works, why it works, and the value of it working, so they don't feel a disconnection between their tagging effort and the cost allocation. And this is why education and enablement are a key here, because while we educated the engineers on the importance of tagging in the cost allocation, we also wanted to bridge the gap between the finance and the engineers. So the finance, so the engineers don't have to perfect it every time and you will still get to where the finance wants, which is a good cost allocation. Basically, this mapping process covers two scenarios. The first scenario, when the value of the tag is null, 
So in this one, we have a default cost center on every single account in Atlassian. It's a good practice because it enables me to allocate every single cost to its, uh, every single resource to a cost center, and this cost center is accountable, and they get charged for it. And also, we have different rules. So for example, we have for the dev and staging accounts, they get allocated to our R&D cost center, or if it's a production account, it gets allocated to a COGS, which is cost of goods sold cost center, and we have different tagging combination as well. So certain services under certain accounts would get a certain uh, cost center tag. The second scenario is when we have an invalid tag. This is when we collaborated again with the finance team around the process where they review the invalid tags because remember, we can detect them and then they have to map them every, at the end of each month only once to the right cost center and it reflects on the current months and also going forward. Of course, we have visualizations that would show to the engineers this mapping pathway, how it works and how it gets tagged. Let's have a look at one of these reports, for example. <coughs> so this mapping pathway, basically, <coughs> is what we display to the engineers so they can understand the difference between the tags they put and how it ended up being allocated. In this example, I have a division one, which is an R&D cost center, and the different spelling mistakes and typos of division one. However, somehow, it ended up being allocated to it ended up being allocated to a production account. So in that case, I'm showing to the engineer that it went through a process we call mapping to COGS, and then it got allocated to Division 10. And with the different spelling mistakes of Division 1, it goes through the invalid business unit mapping, which allocates it to Division 1, and subsequently, mapping to COGS allocated to Division 10. So they show the engineers the difference between the tags they put and how it ended up being allocated and the reasons why, so they understand how the mapping process works. At this stage, I've had at least 99% of my cost tagged and allocated to the right cost center, and this is when FinOps come and we do more reallocations. So for example, we do chargeback for the costs that are material enough, like Cube or Splunk. We reallocate them to the cost center that actually use them. And also, for the non-usage cost that is material enough, like for example, the support cost, we also redistribute them to the cost centers because we want to reconcile with the cloud provider invoice. At this stage, I've had the data ready and cleaned up, and I push it through automated feed daily to the finance systems so they can reuse it in their analysis. This is when I stop, and I hand over to Brett to take us through the finance side of the budget process. Thanks, Sarah. So once FinOps has set up all the processes around tagging, hierarchy, allocations, Finance ingests that enriched data to produce forecasts for a rolling 12-month period and a three to five year long range plan. Sorry, click. So in Atlassian, we have a range of FinOps personas involved in the forecasting process. The FinOps team obviously is relied on heavily by finance during the forecast process. FinOps provides actual, actual enriched spend data trend analysis and rate and usage optimization opportunities while also gathering technical requirements from the business. We rely heavily on engineering and product teams to inform our spend forecasts as it relates to architectural changes, build out new features, future migrations, and any other technical changes that has the potential to impact costs. In Atlassian, we have a cloud spend finance team responsible for the overall roll up of the cloud spend However, we partner very closely with our FP&A business partners who are responsible for managing their business units to their budgets and communicating any forecast changes to their teams. Cloud Finance provides the foundational data and tools they need to ensure successful execution of their budgets. We also provide key insights into our cloud spend with leadership, such as growth drivers, performance against efficiency targets, hotspots uh, that require executive focus. To be able to create a forecast, we use the cloud bill and our tagging data to assign ownership and cost allocations to departments. We are in the process of moving from our current method to a future state, as the current method is just not scalable. We needed to find a way to reduce data points and make a more streamlined process. It's also a great time to highlight that FinOps is an evolving practice, and it's okay to change and pivot when required. In the current state, we take our cloud bill and split it between dedicated cloud accounts and shared cloud accounts. Dedicated accounts have a one-to-one -one mapping with their department, which means they own the account for the forecasting process and cost allocation. 
For the shared accounts, we use the service to service group tagging to create service group level forecasts, which then get split to the departments. The need to move away from the current method is to ensure scalability in the future. We've moved towards more account sharding, whereby we are creating more and more accounts each day for greater platform resiliency and security. As a result of this, the forecasting process based of accounts will soon become redundant. Moving towards service group level forecasting will allow us to manage forecasts in a world where we, we may have thousands of accounts. In the future model, we're essentially eradicating the idea of an account being owned by a team. So long as a service is tagged to the service group and department, we can assign ownership and costs easily. With this method, it won't matter how many accounts we have, but rather the focus will be on tagging accuracy. Now, at Atlassian, we use four different methods for forecasting, which are decided upon with uh, our business. They include historical trending, unit economics, cost as a percentage of X, and manual override. Historical trending uses specific periods of time, typically three or six months, to determine the average month-on-month -month growth. That average is then applied to the latest spend uh, of actual data and then extrapolated to create the forecast. Unit economics is, uses a selected cost driver and creates a monthly cost per chosen driver. For example, cost per user, cost per request, or cost per minute. That cost driver is then applied to the forecasted driver for the 12 month rolling period and then extrapolated. Cost as a percentage of X is usually used in our dev slash test environments. Uh, an example would be where we might have a Jira dev account and a Jira prod account and the Jira dev is, dev is a percentage of the prod. Manual override is used to override all other methods at the end of the forecast. It generally takes an externally created forecast and then hard codes it into our system. Examples include new departments, new services before we have history, and of course, my favorite item, uh, cost-saving initiatives that we can't allocate directly to the unit. Once we lock in a forecast, we track against many different targets over many different periods. One thing I've learned in my 15 years of forecasting is that forecasts are never perfect. But what is more important is that key assumptions are documented. Finance, with the help of FinOps, monitor spend at a daily granularity to detect anomalies as early as we can. Each week, Finance takes the latest spend data and extrapolates it for the rest of the quarter and communicates outlook for that in-quarter period. Each month, Finance reviews the latest build from our cloud vendors and identifies the root cause of material variances using assumptions at the time of the forecast compared to what actually happened in that period. After three months of doing all the above, finance gets to revisit our forecasts, make updates, and include any new information that may have been made available to create a more accurate forecast for the next 12 months. On top of this, we also provide a view on how our cloud spend contributes to our gross margins. This allows us to identify necessary actions ahead of time if they're not looking as healthy as we like. Now, Sarah is going to give you an example of the tracking FinOps do with our engineers. Thanks. Thank you, Brett. So after the finance creates the budget, this is where it goes back to FinOps because we manage it with the engineers around the clock. So in engineering, we do have weekly, monthly, and quarterly operational rituals with the service owners and the budget managers. It's like a complete service management reports for their services that includes many operational metrics. And of course, cost is one of them. Depends on the context. We have different data and visualization in every ritual that would help um, and would fit with the purpose. So the one that we have on the screen right now is the one that we have in the quarterly ritual, which actually runs midway through the quarter because we wanted to give the engineers and the budget managers an early indication of overspending and give them time to take corrective actions. So for example, if I'm a budget owner or if I'm an engineering manager, I look at this graph and I recognize the yellow line on top being the budget because I own it, I participated in setting it, and I'm accountable for it. And we also show them the budget burned down and how much they have burned out of their budget as of today, which is the dark blue line, and also how much they're expected to end the quarter on, which is the light blue line. So this, this gives them an early chance to pull that in and take corrective actions. And this is very important <coughs> to put the data in the visualization in the path of those who can change the outcome 
at the right time so they can take corrective actions if needed. And this was our approach to manage the cloud, the budget, and spend in Atlassian. Let's share with you some of the lessons that we learned in our journey because it wasn't all rainbow and sunshine. So to be perfectly honest, when we first came with the budget process, engineers were very resistive of the idea of having a budget because for them, first of all, budget limits their innovation. And second, they really didn't trust the numbers or the processes because they were not involved in setting the budget. On the other side of the equation, the finance team were struggling to get the inputs that they needed for an accurate budget and forecast, like new deployments or new features, etc. This is when FinOps came in and created a collaboration point where the two teams can discuss together and take informed decisions on our cloud cost. So now the engineers and the engineers manager are actually involved in setting the budget. They have an input into it. They know it. They are accountable for it. And the finance have the right inputs they need to build an accurate forecast. And this is why building partnerships is extremely important for the success of any FinOps practice. The second one is about collaborating instead of dictating. So this tagging, when I mentioned the tagging policy, we could have easily enforced that tagging policy in Atlassian. Any resource that is not tagged with these four resources will be terminated. But instead, we took a step back and we automated a process that will still get us to where we want, which is good tagging and good cost allocation, while we put less effort on the engineers to perfect it. This is why collaboration is also important. Third one, which is very dear to my heart, because I'm originally a data person, like I mentioned, that visibility is a key. Make sure you put data in the path of those who can change the outcome so they can understand the impact of the decisions they take on the cost, on the budget, on their product gross margin. And these are not only the engineers, but also your products team and your finance team. Last one, because we all tend to perfect everything from the first time, but we all know that it's not true, and going through the crawl, walk around journey actually takes time. Like you could all see, we didn't do all this in a week, a month, or even a year. We've built this in more than three years, and we're still changing and adjusting because like Brett mentioned, it's an evolving practice, and we're still learning a lot, and this is why we're here. However, it's very important that at every stage, you do the best you can, and you <coughs> progress slowly from there. And this is how we do it. Any questions? I think Joe will be going around the room with the mic for questions. There you go, Andy. People uh, wow. don't drop the mic. There you go. So, so my question is, uh, and maybe I'll use some AWS specific terms, but you know, your budget and graph is, is very simple. But when you start to throw in things like savings plans or res reserved instances or map funding or your enterprise discount plan, like how do you make that still accurate for the teams? If you could maybe shed a little light on that detail. Sure, I can take that question. So basically, when we look at our budget and forecast, we do look at two numbers and we build them based on two numbers. First one is the public on-demand pricing. So we're not using any um, big discounts in a way. And then we also do it on what we call fully loaded cost, which is the cost including any discounts that we have. So we produce actually the budget on forecast based on these two numbers and because we understand that some cases the discounts is not really controlled by the teams. So when we discuss with the teams, we actually discuss with them based on the on-demand pricing. And then we have the data available in both numbers just in case. All right. I, I, I'm going to be very gentle with the box. <laughs> if you drop the mic, you lose the point. That's the rule here. get over that and how do you make sure, thank you, and how do you make sure um, teams are not penalized for optimization? Cool. Yeah. Uh, sure. So she's wondering if uh, with the reservations, the saving plans or any commitments that teams are reluctant to commit because they think it will burn their budget. Did I understand you correctly? Cool. Uh, I can answer this one as well. So for us, the way that we do it, we do it based on the amortized spent. So, and we also try to educate the engineers 
on what commitments and how commitments will help them stay within the budget. So when we do, um, so in Atlassian, the saving plan purchase is driven by FinOps. We drive it, we own it, we see the saving plan optimizations, we don't let team decide. Uh, but for example, for the reservation, it has to be committed because it's specific instance types and it's locked in. Uh, we also show the savings for the team, like how much they would be able to save. And we use amortized spend in the budget and forecast process. So we're not using, like for example, if there is any upfront purchases, for example, it's not like really upfront, it's like the amortized spend of the commitment. So they understand that, okay, if I committed for 12 months, this is how much I'm saving and this is how much it, would, it will help me with my budget. I understand the challenges of the budget, but I think the main challenge that we have is the certainty of commitment because things can change and the, especially the reservations, the instance type and the configuration can change. And I think this is the biggest resistance. This is why we have to communicate with the teams when buying the RI specifically because we want to make sure that they commit and they understand what commitment is and how it will help them save money. Yeah, but like how, will, how does it impact your future budgets? Because say year zero, they have $100,000, and over the year, they were able to do a lot of optimization, they were able to save about $20,000. So now the actual spend for year zero was 80000 So when it comes to year two annual budget, they are afraid they're going to have to start at 80000 and they lose that $20,000 budget that they previously had. Yeah, so there's always that pressure that when you save the money, you might lose it. Um, from a financial point of view, the way I've been able to get through with engineers is coming at it as a let's save money around the areas where we can get efficient and then let's use that money to reinvest. So it's not about, it's not about let's t not take it away, let's figure out how to save money on stuff that we don't need and let's go spend it on amazing things that can add to revenue or let's build new products or new features. And adding to what Brett said, this is why we're building the budget on two numbers. One of them is the public pricing, which doesn't include any discounts, including the commitment discounts, because we understand that sometimes the discount is not a factor they can control, but we're showing them the budget in both numbers and we tell them this is your budget and this will be your spend. And we show them the spend as well on both numbers. So this is one of the reasons we also have it on the on-demand pricing. One last question. Yeah. Curious how much of your role in FinOps is cost management, not just the allocation and reporting. So for example, at our company, I'm responsible for reducing costs for everybody. Like I can't just say, oh, these engineers, you guys got to fix this. And what we found is when we're not dealing with EC2 or S3, right? With EC2, okay, we can reserve, we can get a savings plan, or we can tear S3 down to Glacier. But we have a lot of workloads that aren't in those two. So I'm curious, how, what is your role in cost management? If you see, hey, this group's spiking, do you then say, hey, could you guys look at some of your workloads, or is that something they have to resolve within their own team? Okay, if I got you right, you understand what's the role of FinOps in the cost management. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so in Atlassian, FinOps basically, we drive and encourage teams in terms of the cost management. So we, we kind of own all the cost management pra practices, but the teams have to take the actions themselves. So we provide guidance, we provide support, we provide insights, we provide data. For example, the anomaly detection, we that we, like you said, we let the teams know that there's a spike in their cost or even a decrease in their cost. And we try to understand the reasons why. Is that like uh, planned work? Have they worked with the fp &E on this <coughs> spiking cost? Um, is it unplanned? Is it a bug? Is it an issue? So we kind of work with them on the reasons why. This is why we drive and own a lot of things, but our role is basically provide the guidance and press practices teams have to own their cloud usage. When it comes to waste, for example, we, that we do let teams know that they have potential waste or underutilized resources and right sizing exercises. We provide them with the data. We have reports and stuff that would show them any usage optimization opportunities, but we don't take actions on their behalf. We have cost engineers, which are some of the roles in our team. They work very closely with the high spender teams and work with them on architecture recommendations of different things, and this is another use case of usage optimization, probably for another day to discuss, but they also work with teams, but the teams have to take the actions themselves. We provide best practices and guidelines, basically. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sarah and Brett. If you can click the next slide, you can find them, you can connect with them uh, on LinkedIn and also find them where? Oh, on the aircraft carrier. The aircraft carrier celebration. Feel free to grab any of us anytime for any questions or any thoughts you might have. We're also, we're always available for a chat. Thank you, Joe, and thank you, everyone. All right, big round of applause. Thanks for watching that session. 
I'm sitting here in San Diego right after FinOpsX. We hope you join us next year here live 2024. In the meantime, please subscribe to the channel and join the community. Get involved, join the summits, get in a working group, and don't forget to get FinOps certified. It's next year here in San Diego for FinOpsX. It's gonna be twice as big. Come join the party, come meet your people. Welcome home.